Yasmin and Brandon, you were talking about two things that were quite sort of um, in conflict with one another, I guess. Yasmin, you were talking about how you were quite worried or concerned about um, how addicted we all are to our phones, I guess. I'm worried about that too, um, just because I wake up in the morning and kind of like, oh, well, what, what time is it? I've <laughs> been on Instagram for an hour. Um, but obviously, Brandon, you've built your whole kind of career online and it's really been something that's helped you explore and nurture your creativity so yeah. it's like i'm interested in, so, in the kind of different ways you both see that yeah i think uh the online space is you know probably the most powerful thing humanity has ever made um at least from what we use today and uh yeah i've built my entire company and everything i do based off of the online space um, and, I, and generally, I see it as a positive. I think the fact that we're so connected is, is such a good thing. Mm. Um, my team that I work with are spread across the globe. And without something like the internet, we wouldn't be able to function. And we wouldn't be able to you know, find the best talent uh, without the internet. Yes, it does lead to you know, uh, waking up and doing, uh, spend an hour on Instagram or whatever. Um, but I think the fact that uh, we're able to share content, we're able to talk to people, we're able to you know, connect is such a powerful thing. Um, and uh, I, I do agree with you in some sense that, we, uh, that there needs to be off time as well as on time. And for me doing business, um, I much prefer still to go and meet people and you know, see them, uh, even speak to them over the phone is so much more powerful than emails or you know, instant messaging. Um, so there is still a world, I think, that lives outside of the internet. Yeah. Um, but lots and lots of, you know, our generation definitely um, is moving online. And I think uh, the important thing to do is to move with it mm. uh, rather than fight against it. Do you think that the internet has maybe kind of not allowed you to realise your potential as a dancer, though? <laughs> oh, I, 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 I did I? used to dance when I was you younger. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important <laughs> to... Uh, explain because uh, I think what uh, what you're doing is fantastic and it's amazing and I love digital uh, and I think uh, you know the whole use of what we can do is uh, with the digital influence and technology is massive and it's massive in terms of communication yeah. and outreach and reaching much further away and being able to comment and but I my fear is how it's effect on our individual bodies and our ability to express with our own body. Mm. And that's because our body is our first tool. It's greater than anything else. Our own body is greater than any creation that come in the future is the creator of our own body. The ability of our body to communicate vocally, emotionally, intellectually, in, in the way that we communicate our thoughts and idea and creation to the world, Whatever, how we do it, if we do it in a spoken word, if we do it in music, if we do it in, in visual, we still use our body to communicate it. That's the source, that's the main source of our expression, of our life. Um, and seeing how we are completely re reflection on Black Mirror, I don't know if any of you seen Black Mirror, which is a fantastic, fantastic series about what could happen, what technology could if you haven't seen it, please go and it's on Netflix or, you know, go and watch it. <laughs> because it's, it's a fantastic outlook of what technology could make us as a society. What are the risks just if we are not going to watch out for the danger of, of that technology and digital life? Um, I think it has, it has amazing power and potential. It's all about the balance of how we balance between the two, how we use it to the best way and being able to also um, still express and communicate with our own, with our own self. Mm. Could I just say a bit about that? Um, I, I was talking to Brandon before we came in, and uh, I see a real problem with the educating the older generation. We're getting a real generation, intergeneration <laughs> split here. The young, the young people and, uh, fully understand the new technology and are thriving on it. The old generation, some of them, are having difficulty grasping it. And we find now in the county council, we're trying very hard to deliver our services through the web and through, in, through internet 
access, uh, and there's a problem with a number of people, not all, but a number of people, who aren't able to, to use this technology. And that's a real problem. We're going to have to somehow find a way of educating the older generation. Back to school, perhaps, they've got to go, but I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it is an issue for the future. We should get someone to show you how to use Snapchat in the break. <laughs> yeah, just that. How, how do you know I can't use Snapchat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mention Snapchat to him before. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dolly, you were talking about kind of levelling the playing field, I guess, yeah. and um, improving communication between mm. young people and how they can actually bring about change for themselves. Obviously, these, the power is in these guys' hands, kind of, as well yeah. as the young people. So what would you like to say to them in terms of how they can open their ears up and connect more with young people? Because obviously all of you guys are here, relatively engaged in, in the arts and mm. your own potential in the arts. But there are lots of people who, like you say, aren't realising their yeah. potential because they haven't even entertained it. I think, first of all, like, because I've done a great job. <laughs> Guess, <laughs> Guess has been amazing and Guess will continue to do so. Um, I am a massive fan of the model of co-design. Um, so that's uh, working alongside young people, essentially, um, where ideas aren't fully formed yet. So the parameters are quite wide, quite open, and then there's decisions to be made 50-50 between the young people and the, and the professionals mm -hmm. about where we draw those lines and what's actually realistic and what's, uh, what's your, your dream for 2042. Um, but speak, speak, speak to these people. Come out, find us. We are in the streets, we are in youth centres, we are in buildings like this, we are in bedrooms frantically sketching, we are in these online spaces, we are at schools, universities, colleges, walking around outside. Have, just have real honest dialogue with us. Um, come down, meet us at our level. These big buildings like this, believe it or not, three years ago were scary to me. I wouldn't have stepped in this building mm. by myself. Um, and, and that also helps. And I, I know these are councillors and chiefs, executives, but first of all, these are people and I'm a person too. And we, we share that, we have common experience. So language, to me, it can be really important. You have to be able to speak the language of the disengaged, not have acronyms and strategic policy level and talent plans and initiatives. They don't know what that means. Just art is art. Talk about it in plain, simple, honest terms, and you'll find that your young people you really want to talk to about this will not be shy in giving you clear, honest <laughs> responses. And it's just acting on them. Um, anyone can be listened to, but if you're not acting upon what people are saying, uh, there's no point in holding the dialogue, I believe. So, yeah. Thoughts? <laughs> and I think the uh, things like the internet, mobile phones, technology, these are tools. Um, they're not the actual creativity at the end of it. They're, they're a means. And, and over the years, if you go back through history, uh, when people used to uh, etch on cave walls uh, their pictures, that was the they were the tools they had at the time, and they're, they're exactly the same. So I think we've got to embrace those tools. We never want to be frightened by them. They actually mean that we can do things more effectively, more eff efficiently, more brilliantly than we ever imagined. And I think we've got to keep imagining that. But at the end, it's about human beings, exactly echoing what, what you're saying. I also, by the way, your shoes should have their own slide up there. Uh, I think that's the uh, I'm slight, I can't look over there because I'm slightly dazzled every time. But, uh, um, but uh, the, uh, I think it's really, really important that, uh, uh, that people, we, we go back to that human condition of creativity. That's what makes us different. And if we can't imagine the future, and if we can't make sure that people of all ages, and you know, people under 25, are, are licensed and encouraged to have this imagination, and then there are the outlets for it, then we're going to fail. And the other thing I think we, we haven't maybe talked about is the, is the international um, side of this as well. And through history, for a relatively small island, we have really punched above our weight with our creativity across all sorts of sectors, whether it be music or dance or drama or filmmaking. And we need to continue to do that. We want to keep doing that, not just for economic reasons, actually just because it makes it a better place to live and it makes our people live better, happier, healthier lives. And I think we've always got to come down to people. So we, you know, I spend a lot of my time worrying about spreadsheets and, and numbers and, and, and forms and computer programs that people have to come and fill in. But in the end, 
We exist as an arts council to invest money in making great creative things happen, the best possible creative things happen that affect and change people's lives up and down the country and make their lives better. And I think we've always got to come back to the arts, so I absolutely agree with that. Can I just add that um, a lot of communication and art reach now to a lot of viewers via the internet and via mm -hmm. you know, the digital world, but there is nothing like going and seeing the show live. There is nothing like seeing you know, the expression, the sensation, the smell, the, the visual things of seeing art live. I was very, very privileged to grow up in uh, Israel at the time when every school had to go at least twice a year to see art, to see dance or theatre performance. So every class in every school, at least twice a year, gone to the theatre. So I grew up seeing, through all my life, theatre and dance. And I think that was such an influence, such an important thing. So my, a lot of not great things happened in Israel, but the culture developed amazingly mm. because of that. And if something like that could happen here, if we can make that from every background that you are, because if your parents haven't taken you to see opera, you would never go to see opera as an adult, or the chances will be really, really small. Or if your parents never took you to see, and some parents cannot afford that. So, but if, the, if our country, if our society could enable that to take schools to go to the theater, or to go to see art, to go to the gallery, then that would be an amazing thing for our future. You can, you can chip in when it's appropriate. No, Let's I just wanted to just a quick word about, just to say I agree entirely with what Daniel just said there yes. about engagement with young people. All I can say is we do try hard. Uh, yeah. Do we do yeah. enough? Yeah. No, we don't do enough, and we ought to do more. Everybody can always do more. <laughs> cool. Um, so if you want to ask a question, just do wait for the roaming mic to reach you. This is a question for Jasmine Vardaman. Um, just first of all, I just wanted to say I absolutely believe about the body being the first tool, and I think that's really important. I support technology and all that, but I um, absolutely agree with you on that. I wanted to ask you about um, what you said about women in the arts and it wanting to be supported. And I was just, uh, not that I'm cross with it, but I was just aware of the ratio on stage as well. And um, I also believe, I'm not, of course I don't feel like, no, no, annoyed about it, but I just was interested in about what you, how you approach that in your work and make women feel also believed to do the yeah. same. Uh, okay, so I give an example. I was the first artistic director of the Youth Dance Company, the National Youth Dance Company. I've been asked by Sadler Wells, who are an associate artist there, and being the first female associate artist there, and almost the only one for a few years, uh, to be uh, the first artistic director of the National Youth Dance Company. When we came to the auditions, there were a lot of very, very talented kids, a lot of them between young, young people. And um, somebody whispered in my ear, make sure you take equal amount of boys and girls. And I said, no, there are such more talented girls here. I don't think it's fair that I will not use them or not take them to the company because I need to keep equal amount and give equal. So I think the, um, the positive discrimination a lot of the time is problematic because you're not go by the talent. You go because you have to give an equal amount to male or female. And in the dance world, what happened a lot of time because there are not a lot of female dancers or male choreographers, they get a lot more support from very, very early age. The teacher will give them a lot more support so they will become, because there are hundreds of girls and just one boy, so they will get a lot more support throughout the whole progression and career. And um, I realized that what happened in the art world is that when women are leading a big group of artists, so as a choreographer or as a theater director or as a filmmaker or as a conductor, there are fewer and fewer women that get trusted to, mm -hmm. and I feel it's about trust. It's the trust of the, of the community to really. Um, so in my work, in what I do, I first of all never ask people to, sex, to send CV to audition. I never pre-select people by their gender or by back, their background or anything. They're, my auditions are always open to everyone. I want to be just impressed by their personality, what they have to offer. I don't care about the background, I don't care about their experience, I care about what they can offer as, as a performer. And um, 
Over the year with JV2, we supported a lot of female choreographers, not just because they're female, just because I thought they are, they are incredible and talented as well as male. So I'm trying to not discriminate or positive discriminate, but just to really be affected by the talent and, and to support. Um, any other questions? I can't see, by the way, so you have to wait and flap about. <laughs> Um, this is a question for all of you. Uh, do you think that by 2042, uh, a, a path to a career in arts is going to be more affordable? A career in arts. Uh, I, 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 I think there's an obligation uh, on us to make that happen. Mm. Um, you know, I think uh, it can't be to preserve for a, a bunch of people who happen to have been born into a situation where they. Uh, can afford it. So, you know, as I say, you know, talent from every community and also to make sure that the people who are coming and working in the arts and the people who are making the, the decisions in the arts, and that's really, really crucial. It's about the, the gatekeepers, the, the decision makers, uh, that they are reflective of the way the, the streets of England look and feel in the 21st century. So, so yes, I believe it's, you know, m I'd have failed doing this job if we hadn't got that. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what type of stuff is automated and what type of stuff isn't by then, and how the world and, uh, and our country changes uh, to cater to that, because uh, although creativity uh, will be automated to an extent, um, there's, there's like bots nowadays that can write poems that, you can, that trick people into thinking they're humans, I think there's still a huge level um, of stuff like going to the theatre that you can never replace uh, with uh, people, and I wonder if by the time we get to, say, 2042, I'll be 42 then, <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, we have a completely different outlook on how the world will be um, and, and jobs that are automated will no longer require to be going, people going in that direction and what direction people will be placed into. Yes, I'm personally optimistic about it. I think in, in my lifetime I've seen an enormous change between the traditional professions to the opportunities now provided by the creative sector, and, and I think this can only grow. So I think we will see uh, much more better uh, opportunities by that, that date. I it depends who's in government as well, I guess. <laughs> I, guess so. I would comment. I'm probably <laughs> ca cautiously optimistic. I, I am a bit of a realist, and I have seen over your gears. Um, for example, this campus is stunning and the stuff here is stunning. Um, I wouldn't be able to afford to go here and, mm. and I am a working artist. Um, a lot of the experiences I've had over the past three years, uh, if it wasn't my job, I would have been priced out of immediately. Mm. Um, so there are loads of doors and glass ceilings to push through, but yeah, I think wider political issues also have to be addressed by the key decision makers and Darren's exactly right, if it is not cheaper, easier, more supportive for young people to, to break through and to really pr actually have a career in the arts that is paid, um, then yeah, we, have, we have let you down and, and we have failed. But it's not just Darren's responsibility, it's every single person in this room to make sure that that does happen and we, we do get that point, but yeah, cautiously optimistic. The one thing I'd say is by 2042, you guys are going to be in the position of power. Yeah. So you will actually be making a difference. People like me will be on the scrap heap. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be saying, remember that thing we did in Canterbury, can I do a bit of consultancy for you now? Yeah. <laughs> Just like so finish paying off the mortgage. But, but um, you know, you guys will make it, and you will have that power. So everything you do between now and then will be leading up to being able to be those key influencers. I just wondered what the sort of experience was that about three years ago that opened the door for you. I mean, you can for, be as specific for, as you want, yeah. For me, um, I was, um, I guess I said real strange. So before I worked for the organisation that I worked for, I was the chairperson of their directory board and the registered company director. Um, and we sat in a meeting and I guess funding application had came up and we sat in about a seven hour meeting um, drawing bridges on a wall and listing off art forms that we thought we would be able to find someone to pull off and be able to do it. Again, sat in a meeting at Creative Scotland with members of the government and this was a strategy all about young people. There was maybe 170 people in the room 
I was considerably the youngest person in the room by about 15 years and the only young person. Um, every 30 seconds, uh, someone would mention young people and how this is great and it's all for game. And I stood up and was like, so where are we? Where are, where are these young people? Why, why is this a youth-led strategy and why am I sitting in a room full of adults just staring at me going, young person, young person. <laughs> um, and then I got asked to join the national group. Um, Colin liked my ideas, I guess, and asked me to join. I was really quite hesitant, I'm not going to lie, because I still had that, I'm not arty, I'm not creative. And then I essentially just started giving it a bash. I was given the space, the freedom and the support to go, I can go to these places, I, I can try this. Um, I now don't have like, any fear of failure at all. I have failed way too many times to care. I actually quite embrace failure. I think you learn a lot more from the mistakes you make and it's very easy to tell when something went wrong. It's a lot harder to put your finger on and narrow down exactly why something's going right. But being given that open, non-judgmental, supportive space just to go, come, try this, if you like it, great, we can help you progress. If you don't, walk away, it's totally fine. You've enjoyed the experience. So, yeah, yeah I'm more process-based artist. I like the creative process. I'm not, I don't care about what the end product looks like. I don't care if it goes up in a gallery or goes, in your shed or in a bin. For me, it's about, uh, honestly, a lot of my art I just bin because it's, it, for me, it's a process and the skills and the knowledge that I've picked up through that process that are important. I believe that I can do things through the arts and everyone can do things through the arts but not sit necessarily within the arts. Like, I don't always maybe want to have a, a career as a, as a community artist. I would rather be one of these boring people with spreadsheets and timetables and, and meetings and, and yeah, it's great. But yeah, it's process based and being given that, that honest space and that, that honest support that it's okay to fail, it's okay to try. If you like it, you like it, if you don't. But like I said, I would have never known if those opportunities hadn't hadn't been offered to me. So I suggest if you can offer those opportunities, because people in this room can, please, please take this back and, and, and try it. I think there's something really important as well, which I've learned since I've been in business and stuff, is you'd be surprised at the amount of people that actually care and will happily, mm -hmm. you know, do oh, yeah. stuff and go out of their way. Here is a small like, army out here. There is, people. not even that small, like mm. the amount of times where I've just, you know, tweeted somebody, you know, asking for a bit of information and then got into a conversation with them about something or other. People, you know, are happy to talk, you know, if you approach them. You know, it's not the easiest thing to approach people. Um, I, I know climbing corporate ladders myself uh, when in my workplace. Um, but uh, I think something important, and it goes back to the connected world, <laughs> is we live in a connected world where, you know, you can tweet people uh, LinkedIn is still, you know, such a powerful tool in, in the business world for connecting with people. You can literally connect with them and then drop them a message. Um, and it's, it's an underrated social media, but it's a really good way to connect with people uh, in general. Cool. Um, I'm afraid we have to wrap up there, but feel free to add one another on LinkedIn if you'd like to connect. Uh, you can accost one another in the break, so see you there. Thank you.